If you followed all the steps in this tutorial up until now, your first sub exposure should look like this. Oh my gosh. Photographing the Milky Way is a lot more accessible to the average person than you might think. You don't need a ton of expensive gear or the darkest skies in the world, and you definitely don't need any outside experience in photography to get yourself going. The first time I photographed the Milky Way, it was an experience that changed my life forever, and I'm hoping through these five steps, you too can take a picture of the Milky Way that will blow your mind. Normally in these videos, I like to focus on deep sky astrophotography through a telescope, but in this video, I'll give you my best tips and tricks for photographing the Milky Way at home with whatever gear you have lying around your house right now. With these five steps, if they're followed correctly, you'll be on your way to taking a portrait of our very own Milky Way galaxy. This type of photography is called wide field astrophotography, and the only differences between this and the deep sky alternative is that it's less expensive and it's more zoomed out so you'll be able to see more space in one picture. If you really want to take your wide field astrophotography to the next level, many experienced astrophotographers will purchase a high quality tracking mount and a nice camera lens to really get that extra level of professional quality out of their images. None of that's required for this video, however. I won't actually be shooting this tutorial from my backyard like you see me in right now. Pretty soon I'll be heading over to a resort in Wisconsin with some much darker skies, which will improve the quality of this image by a lot. Chances are though, if you're not shooting near any big cities like I am, your light pollution levels are low enough from your own yard to be able to take a great Milky Way image without having to drive an inch. So come along with me as I demonstrate how you can take a picture of our own Milky Way galaxy with gear that you just might have lying around your own house. So here we are at the Ostoff Resort in Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin. I'm actually not on the resort grounds right now. I'm at a parking lot about a half a mile away, as this is the only spot I could find that was open enough to do some shooting, as the park that I planned to shoot at turned out to be closed off for nighttime, so I'm not gonna be shooting there. But uh, this parking lot is the next best thing. It's right outside of a golf course, so there's not too many trees. There's trees behind me, but right to the south where the Milky Way is and to the north where Polaris will be is completely clear, so I'm really happy about that. I'm really lucky that that this parking lot exists because I was banking all my money on that park that I was talking about earlier and I knew if that didn't work out then I wasn't gonna be able to shoot so I was devastated when I saw the big gate saying closed after sunset thankfully I checked Google Maps and it said this huge parking lot was just another couple minute walk away so I'm gonna be shooting here now I think it's definitely gonna be a little creepy once I get here after dark there's a lot of trees around and it's pretty forested behind me so I'm gonna be keeping my head on a swivel for any animals that are willing to come out and say high at 11.30 at night. The very first step that you want to take in wide field deep sky astrophotography is figuring out your location. In terms of light pollution, astrophotographers use a scale called the Bortle Scale. It runs from 1 to 9, with 1 being the lowest and 9 being the highest in terms of light pollution. So the lower the better. If you're curious where your location falls on the light pollution scale, and trust me, I would be if I was trying to take a shot like this, head to a website called lightpollutionmap.info. Click on any location and it'll display a little pop-up with all the information that you need to to know about the light pollution for that pin you just dropped. The light pollution level for this town is a Bortle 4, which actually is pretty good. It's a lot better than my yard, which living about a half an hour away from Chicago is about as bad as it gets. For your location, you generally want it to be under a Bortle Class 7 if you want some great results of the Milky Way. If you're higher than 7 and you don't want to drive anywhere, don't worry. With the processing techniques that I'll show you with software later in the video, you'll still be able to see a lot of that Milky Way core. Don't get me wrong, it's nothing I'd post on Instagram, 
around, but it's still cool and pretty incredible to see all that detail from such a light polluted location. So take a second and try to figure out the light pollution levels for the location you plan to shoot at. If it's looking pretty high, don't be afraid to drive somewhere that's a little bit darker. Keep in mind that this is the number one thing that will take your astrophotography image from good to great. Light pollution isn't the only thing that will affect your final image though. Keep in mind about how high the trees are from your location. You want to have a clear open view to the south and if you're using a tracking mount you want to have a clear open view to the north as well for polar alignment. Moon phase also has a huge impact on your final image. If you're shooting with a 50% moon or more you might not be able to get any detail on the Milky Way core depending on where it is in the night sky. This can make or break your image, trust me on this one. The last thing you want to keep in mind before setting up everything is what time of year you're shooting at. July is the best month from the northern hemisphere to take a picture of the Milky Way, but any months from May through early September will do. So once you have your location all figured out, it's time to decide on what gear you're going to use. Any camera will work for this as long as it's not one that's on your smartphone. So DSLRs, mirrorless cameras, and point and shoot cameras will all work for this. Notice I said point and shoots, so you don't need an interchangeable lens. Just as long as it's relatively zoomed out, you know, around 18 millimeters, then it'll work fine. The camera I'll be shooting with tonight is the Canon EOS M50. It's an entry-level mirrorless camera that you can pick up for about 400 bucks used online. But there are many other much cheaper alternatives that will do the exact same if not better of a job that you guys might have lying around your own house. As for the lens, I'll be using a Canon 18 to 55 millimeter kit lens. It's the one that comes with most of their DSLRs nowadays. And if you happen to have a Canon DSLR camera lying around your house, that's probably the lens that's lying around with it. Like I mentioned a little bit earlier, using a tracking mount is what a lot of more experienced astrophotographers will do to really bump up the quality in your images. I'm assuming most of my beginner viewers won't have that, however, so I'll be shooting with a static tripod for this tutorial. No tracking whatsoever. But once I'm done shooting this, I will go back and shoot everything with a better camera, better quality lens, and higher quality tracking mount, just to show you guys what an impact gear can have on your final image. The last thing that will come in handy is one of these. This is called an interval. This one's from Pixel Pro. It's their TW283 model. They're pretty cheap and what this little remote does is it allows me to take pictures with my DSLR without having to touch it at all. It's a remote shutter cable. This is definitely not a necessity for shooting these images, but it comes in handy a lot and it's definitely the cheapest item on this list. Alright, if you're ready to get started with all your gear tonight and get shooting, then you're ready to move on to step 3. Alright, we have fast forwarded a little bit as you can see. It's a lot brighter out here than I initially imagined. I didn't take into account how many lights were around me at this location, but it is very, very bright, yet it's still really creepy. I call the third step getting set. This includes driving to your location if you need to, getting your star tracker polar aligned and centering the Milky Way, and prepping all your camera settings if you need to do that too. Sky Guide, the app that I mentioned earlier, will help you a ton in this process. It's free on Apple, I know, but if it's not available for your phone for whatever reason, there are a ton of other planetarium apps, such as Stellarium and Night Sky and many others. I just find Sky Guide to be my favorite. The Milky Way will be always facing to the south, so once you have the Planetarium app on your phone all downloaded and set up, go ahead and point it towards the south from your shooting location and you should be able to see the Milky Way core. It should be pretty hard to miss, even if you can't see it with your naked eye. Alright, so as you can see, I have centered my Canon EOS M50 on the core of the Milky Way using the app Sky Guide, and I'm going to walk you through all the settings you should set your camera to to get a great shot of the Milky Way. Alright, so before you change anything on your camera, go into the 
image quality settings and make sure it is set to raw. If it is set to JPEG, you will not be able to process your image at all. And that is arguably just as important as taking the actual image itself, is processing it. All right, after you've set your camera image quality, we're going to focus on a star. Now this camera is already focused, but if you want to focus on the night sky, pick the brightest star in the field of view and adjust the focus ring when you're in manual focus mode until the stars are pinpoint sharp, just like you'd focus a camera in the daytime, just on a star. After you're all focused and ready to go, set the image exposure time to about 20 seconds. 20 seconds is about the benchmark for where your stars start to trail when you're untracked in astrophotography, so I'm going to set it there, and if they're too trailed, then I'll reduce the shutter speed by a little bit. Now that your shutter speed is set, we're going to make sure that your ISO is set to auto and your lens is wide open. A lot of people say that you should stop down your lens for extra sharpness, but that's really if you're tracking with a tracking mount. You're untracked, so you're really just trying to get all the light in your camera as possible in a short amount of time. The last thing that you will set before taking your very first image of the Milky Way is in your camera shooting settings. You're going to set it to self timer continuous and set the number to 10. This is how I get around not having an intervalometer to automate all my shots. I just set it to self timer continuous and it'll take 10 shots by itself before I have to re-hit the shutter button again. It's the next best thing to having an intervalometer. So after you've set your shooting mode to self timer continuous, you are all set to take your very first image of the Milky Way. If you followed all the steps in this tutorial up until now, your first sub-exposure should look like this. Oh my gosh. Now I don't know if you can see what I'm seeing here, but that is definitely the Milky Way. Now I'm going to really quickly check for star trails here. So I'm gonna zoom in on one of the stars, and if there's lines, then I'll shorten it a little bit, and it looks like there's just a little bit of star trailing there. So I'm going to shorten the sub-exposure time to 15 seconds and we'll try that again. Alright, so you can definitely see it in there still. And those stars look pretty clean. I'm going to take a total of 20 of these shots and I'll show you how to stack them in a later image. But basically, the more images you get, the better. You don't need to spend hours and hours taking these shots like you would with a deep sky astrophotography image, but you should get about 15 to 20 images to completely remove all that noise. All right, so as you can see, we are back at home for step five, the final step of the video, which is processing your image. Your image processing can vary from no processing at all to very in-depth, complex processing for hours at a time. For the sake of this video, I'll be keeping it very simple, but I'll make a full in-depth processing tutorial in a future video. There's nothing worse than when someone flies through a tutorial like this, making it impossible to follow along. So at this point, I'll make the video a little bit slower paced, giving you hopefully enough time to at least pause the video and follow along that way. So the software that I have open on my computer right now is called Sequitur. It's free and I'll link the download button in the description so that you can download and follow along because this is probably the most important software out of the two I'm going to show you. So there's a lot of options here, but you really only need to know a few of them. Most of them are just going to be double clicking to turn them on and you don't even need to know what they do. So the first thing you want to do is you want to double click on the star images button in the top left corner and then select your images from your SD card in your camera. This will open up all your sub-exposures. So as you can see, I just did that. I have 21 files open, and I think it shows your first one that you opened, so like the first one you took. So this happens to be my first one. It's completely unedited and unstretched. The next thing you want to do is you want to double click the output button. This will set a destination for your final stacked image or the image that will be produced when all of your 21, in this case, sub exposures are blended together. So I'm going to do that right now and I'm going to set it to my desktop. So I just named it Milky Way 1. So after this is all set, you can go into these million different options here. You only need to worry about a couple, like I said. So first thing you want to do is just click on where it says Composition Align Stars. 
if it if it doesn't say that up there for whatever reason just click on whatever it says up here so you can see once you click on that you'll get this dialog up here as long as it's set to align stars up here you're good then just make sure you have freeze ground selected so what this will do is it will stack your foreground like the trees and the, the house here and the sky here separately so if you move your camera in between images you don't have to worry about the foreground getting all blurry because it will stack them individually and blend them together it's really really nice actually this is the only software that i know of that does this and i really really like it so in order to tell the software what the ground is and what the sky is you need to click where it says sky region full area and then select irregular mask and then also select auxiliary highlight you will then be prompted with this brush here this circle you can use the scroll wheel to set the size of it and you'll just brush over what the sky is it does not have to be precise at all um, just a general idea of what the sky is so the software can sort of figure out what it's looking at here so I'm going to do that right now you can see as soon as you drag it highlights all of the uh, the objects or whatever that it sees that's what that auxiliary highlight means so you can see I'm just going over pretty rough what it is and um, also if you accidentally make a mistake like this and you drag over what the ground is you can right click and drag and it will erase whatever selection you made there so that's really helpful so like you if you're a little sloppy there just right click and drag and you're good so this is a pretty good mask you could go in and be a little bit more in-depth but I'm gonna keep it like this for now so it knows what the sky region is and what the ground is auto brightness just double click that and turn that on um, if one of your sub exposures was messed up or there are different levels of brightness it'll automatically adjust them to make them all the same brightness which is nice high dynamic range you're gonna to want to double click that just turn that on what that'll do is it'll brighten up the dark areas and dim the lighter areas giving it more dynamic range so that when you edit it it'll be easier to edit remove dynamic noises what sequitur considers dynamic noises are hot pixels or dead pixels on your camera sensor they're really hard to see i think this is one right up here but as you can see, they're really, really hard to spot and they're not a big deal, but it's always better to get rid of them and just make your image look that much better. Now, reduce distortion effects. This took a little bit of research to figure out what this actually was. But with certain lenses, actually, my nice one that I'm filming on right now has this issue. What distortion effects are is warping within the glass of the lens. So over time, if the sky is moving in your field of view, uh, the different parts of the image will get warped differently and it'll make a really ugly image when it's finally stacked. It won't be able to align all the stars the same way. So the distortion effects, it'll just detect the distortion that your lens has or the amount of warping that it gives to its image and it'll adjust that and just make the stars a lot nicer in your field of view. So you want to double click that and after you double click that it should set it to complex. If it's on tele, you want to just set it to complex. And the final one you want to adjust, and arguably the most important, is its amazing reduce light pollution feature. Double click that, and it should go to uneven. If it's on deep sky, just set it to uneven. And for this image right here, I was at a relatively dark sky spot, a Bortal 4. So I'm going to set it right in the middle as it's set and you always want to have the intelligently aggressive feature on that reduces different spots of the image a little bit differently so it'll reduce the brighter spots more than the darker spots you obviously want that it'll make your image a lot higher quality but basically if you are in a higher light polluted area like if i was shooting from my backyard trying to get an image like this i would have this set all the way up to strong but if you're in a location which has virtually no light pollution like you know somewhere in the desert or something like that you would double click this and you just turn it off but as for me I'm going to leave it right in the middle because even though this was a Bortle 4 site this house was giving a lot of light and as you saw earlier in the video there were a lot of lights around me which were washing out the sky a little bit so these are all the settings you need to set I hope I didn't go too fast but as soon as everything is good to go 
you want to hit start and it should do everything automatically and save your final image in the folder that you set the output to. All right, so as soon as it says completed successfully, you can hit close and it'll display your final stacked image. As you can see, it looks a lot better. You can definitely see more detail in the Milky Way than you could with the sub-exposures. It sort of messed up my foreground a little bit. I'm just gonna leave it how it was. Um, it's not crazy noticeable, but if I was gonna be posting this someplace, then I would, I would obviously fix that, but uh, it's good for now. But this is already looking very good. Your results will vary, obviously, to your location. If you're shooting from a higher light polluted area, you might not see what this looks like. If you've got less sub-exposures, you probably won't see this amount of detail. Or you might see more detail if you've got more sub-exposures, or you're shooting from a less light polluted area. So, on to the second half of processing your image. This is going to just be making the details and the Milky Way a little bit brighter and more pronounced. For this, I'm going to be using a free software called GIMP. I was going to be using Adobe Photoshop because that's what I normally use, but I figured that if you're doing this for the first time and you didn't have any Astro gear beforehand, you're probably not willing to pay that 20 bucks a month for Adobe Photoshop. So GIMP is free and I will walk you through how to get your image looking even better with GIMP. Again, the download link will always be located down in the description, so just scroll down and click the link down there labeled GIMP, and hopefully you should be able to download it from that. All right, once you have it all downloaded and open, it should look like this. You shouldn't see any image in here or anything like that. So what you wanna do once this is all open is you wanna go to the top left-hand corner and click on File, and then you're gonna to wanna to go down and click on Open. So once you're in open, you're going to want to find the image that you just made. It should be in whatever folder you set the output to in Sequidor. So go ahead and open that. All right, so as you can see, I have it open now. It should look the exact same as it did back in Sequidor when you were stacking and it showed you your result. So once you do that, it's going to be pretty simple what you need to do. I'm not going to go over any advanced methods here. You're just going to want to go to the Colors tab, click on that and go to Shadows Highlights. Go ahead and click on that. And you can see all these sliders here. None of them are really important except for the shadows. All you're gonna wanna do is just drag this up a little bit, maybe about halfway, actually a little bit more than that. So as you can see, what that did is that brightened our sky but kept our foreground about the same. As you can see, there was light coming up from this house here, so that messed it up a little bit. But if you, you're probably in a better location than I was, I was just kind of in a random parking lot, you probably had better planning skills than I did and you went into a dark spot, so you shouldn't have this issue. Go ahead and click on OK. And then we're gonna want to go back to the Colors tab and click on Brightness Contrast. I'm going to drag the contrast up a little too much drag the contrast up a little bit and that looks pretty good now I'm pretty nitpicky when I process I like to look at everything and just fix every little detail and the two things that I notice that I want to fix here is that the sky is looking a little purple over here and then there's a little bit of weird stuff going on here so I'm gonna go ahead and crop that out so I'm going to go to the Crop tool, and I'm going to drag on what I want the new image to be. So right about there looks pretty good, and I'm going to hit Enter. So as you can see, I cropped out the weird detail. Now all I need to fix is the purple. So I'm going to go to the Colors tab again, that Magic Colors tab, and adjust the color balance. Now this can be a little confusing, but the shadows, if you click on shadows, it will adjust the colors of the darkest point in the image. The midtones, these sliders will adjust the middle brightness areas. And then the highlights, these colors will adjust the brightest point of the image. So if I were to demonstrate this, you can see if I went into midtones here and I put this slider all the way to yellow, you can see all these spots that it deems the middle brightness areas, it made it completely yellow. If I were to go to blue, it would make it completely blue. Now this can be very powerful, so I'm going to go into the shadow section, 
and you can see on this slider here it has magenta on this side and green on this side this is looking a little bit too magenta for me so I'm going to slide it a little bit into the green that was too much right about there looks good so that fixed that magenta issue as you can see preview if I'm gonna turn that off you can see that magenta color is gone I'm gonna click OK once your image is at a spot that you're happy with, all you need to do is go ahead and go back into your file menu and go down to export as. Once you do that, select the spot that you want to export it to and hit export and you should have your image all ready to go. And for a pretty basic processing workflow that turned out pretty good for an untracked shot of the Milky Way that was with no astronomy gear that was with a normal daytime camera setup no extra gear needed and no expensive processing software so hopefully you found this tutorial helpful in a moment i'm going to show you this image in full resolution and then i'll also show you the image i was able to get with my fancy camera lens and tracking setup with better processing software just to give you an idea of how much of a difference gear can make for your image there's a lot of people that say you know gear isn't everything and your processing skills and your experience with the gear you have is the most important which I would actually agree with but there is a ceiling to the gear that you have and once you've unlocked the full potential of whatever gear you're shooting with right now that means it's time to upgrade if you want to get any better images as there is a very visible limit to a untracked setup like I just showed you you are able to get fantastic images but this is about as best as I would say you could get all right, as always, I hope that these images have a little bit more meaning to you as you're able to see the story of what I went through when I was taking all of them, and I will see you in the next video.